the way that it works is um, either you, you get the Kahoot app and you load it onto your phone, which you might be doing in the next you know, 40 minutes or so while we're lecturing about other stuff. Or if you go to kahoot.it in your browser on your phone, and then you enter in the game pin number, which is 409622. I'll just write it up here because I'm going to turn the screen on to doing something else, like our lecture of the day. But we'll come back at the end to play the Kahoot, maybe with five, 10 minutes left. And uh, so if you could already either, if you have the app, just enter in the pin number or go to kahoot.it, enter in the pin number. If you want to download the app now and get it all going, go right ahead. But there's, there's the number. So any questions about it? Once you enter in the pin, it should open up you know, the, the game. And then what happens is up here, I project the questions and you get like a 45 seconds or half 30 seconds to think about it and answer the question and then we answer then, then we answer it up here and you see if you got the answer right or not and then we move on to the next question so it's a way of like being able to play a multiple choice game here in class so it's more fun than i don't know question and answer type of things so that's the that's the pin number and uh let me just write kahoot dot it up here if you're going to go to it through your browser. Let me remind you again of our assignment and just see if there's any questions. Your media use diary. I don't need that whole list open. So, uh, and I'm full screen here. So do, do remember that your homework, uh, uh, which is uh, due in the form of a couple page essay on September 6th. So that's a, a week away now. Uh, I'm asking you to write two pages about how you use media and we really want to know, we want to get a good sense of how you actually use media. So I asked you to do a little diary uh, over a couple of days, let's say to tomorrow, or maybe uh, just write down from the beginning of the day to the end of the day on a piece of paper. You're not turning this into me, so it could be, you know, any old paper, but, uh, you know, write down what medium did you use? You know, and how long you used it. But let's say time of day as well is important. So I know you can't read my writing, but so what medium? It was like, let's say I watched TV uh, Friday night. Uh, I used it for two hours. Okay, and uh, and then you know maybe if you need to remember that you watched uh, I don't know you watched a, a movie or something like that. Just remember. That. So this is really for you just to get a good sense of what you do with media. And we're talking, you know, not chat, not email, or, but otherwise, you know, social media use, anything on your phone, video on your phone, television, radio, things that are podcasts, et cetera. So note it down, get yourself a good list so that you're actually talking about what you actually do. And then I asked you pick one medium that uh, you know is like your go-to, and leave it aside. If it's an app, don't use that app. Can you dedicate a whole day to not using it? Maybe. I, I, I praise you. If you can't, you know, can you give it up for a couple of hours, long enough to feel what it feels like to go without your favorite, your favorite communication medium, and. Uh, um, once you've done that, you know, probably pretty close so that you're not forgetting what that felt like, then I'm going to ask you to write a little two-page essay. Some questions you could think about in that essay. What media do you spend the most time with? And also, what do you spend the most money on? So, uh, you know, if you're, I don't know, play a video game that requires you to spend money and buy a lot of stuff that happens in the game, then, you know, put that in there. How do your media choices relate to your interests and personal identity? So is there, you know, is there something about your media use which you feel says something about you that you, you know, foreground to people? I like indie movies. I don't watch, you know, the Marvel stuff. That, that would be, that's because you're that type of person, right? So consider if something like that is going on. How does your media usage compare or contrast with your classmates? So, you know, you know, people your age, what are they into? Are you totally into something else? Or, you know, or are you sort of like what everyone else is doing at your age? Or could you even generalize that way? 
uh, what conclusions can you draw about the media usage of your age group? So, you know, compared to your parents, for instance, do you, I bet you do consume a lot of different media. So you as an age group, how's that different than older people? Older people watch a lot of TV. Younger people watch little TV. What was your experience of living without a particular medium? You know, how, how was it? Did you feel cut off? Did you feel liberated? You didn't have to deal with every, you know, and so on and so forth. So what does this tell you about media? Uh, and here I say extensions of our human capacities. I must have mentioned that there's a media guy named Marshall McLuhan who said that all media extend our capacities. You know, the computer does so much for us, but it lets us store all kinds of information we could never remember enough. But it's a memory. Uh, you know, social media uh, extends our capacity for friendship. So, you know, we used to just be confined to the people that we would see day in and day out. But now we can have intense relationships that carry on over years and millions of miles away. And we can still, that. so our, our social capacity is extended by social media, you know? So um, see what you can think about that, whether, whether giving up uh, your medium cuts some of that off, and that might be important to you. Any questions about the assignment? Do next Thursday. Do, you know, the diary part is the most, and there's an example down here. So the diary part is the hardest part to do, uh, or just the most time consuming. Hey, Paul and Miko, hi. Good morning to you all. Any questions about the assignment? I don't see anything. So you guys don't have, oh yeah, ciao. Um, for the diary, you write uh, two pages. How many structures? Um, well, that's why I put an example in there. So uh, where is that? Did you get off that already? How crazy. There's an example in the assignment. Okay. Um, so what I'd say is you could structure it just like those questions are asked. So you might start off and saying, you know, I, uh, I, I, you know, I did a diary on two days, Friday and Saturday. And on Friday, I found that I spent, you know, because I was in school, I used my computer a lot. I used my phone, as I always do. I listened to a lot of music. On Saturday, you know, I don't know, I went over to my uncle's house and we watched a game or something. And so first off, deal with the diary stuff. And then in the second part, you know, um, so you could generalize a bit. And in the second part, you could say, and I decided to give up, you know, uh, Snapchat on my phone. And, uh, you know, it was really weird because I was no longer able to organize anything with my friends, and et cetera. So, okay. so I would just work it through in that kind of structure. And there is, as I said, this example is a little longer than you actually have to write. Which is fine, but uh, you know, if you if yours comes out a little shorter, that's okay. All right? Thanks for the question. Okay, no questions coming through chat. So, let's head on to uh, our lecture slides. I usually wind up with 20 tabs open, and it's like, dude, get organized. All right, All right here we go. So you guys remember that we were talking about the early history of uh, the electronic media that the first mass media would have been non-electronic. They would be books and then, uh, you know, broadsheets, which were newspapers and such. So they were printed, but they had that structure of one publisher being able to put out thousands of copies of something, right? And then we talked about the early electronic communication uh, and our first, you know, big mass electronic medium was radio. So we went through a big list of uh, inventors that, um, that, that participated in this uh, invention. We, we did note that, you know, early on a lot of people contribute. So Hertz, the physicist, didn't really, you know, create a radio or anything, but demonstrated the actual existence of the electromagnetic fields around us. And part of that field is, you know, contains frequencies we call radio frequencies. He showed us that a spark, you know, could be, you know, disturb that electromagnetic field. So he demonstrated the existence of radio waves. Didn't do anything with it. Of course, Marconi was the guy who had the idea, well, we could communicate with this, Morse code, right? And then Lee DeForest um, was, he created something called the audion tube. And the audion tube actually amplified those weak radio signals so that they could travel way, way further. 
And um, uh, Armstrong, who we'll talk about today, helped to develop the tuning circuit, which meant you'd have different frequencies. So you could have, you know, basically now a radio station could travel for hundreds of miles. Has anyone had the experience? Has anyone actually listen to AM radio anymore? AM radio? Uh, I know. Well, that was the original type of radio. And of course, we still get AM radio. But one thing you might notice, and I did when I was a kid, of course, we didn't have all the other great media you have now, but I had a little radio, and it, AM radio, and at night, you would get stations from hundreds of miles away. Because oddly enough, at night, the radio signal reflects off the ionosphere and travels way, way further uh, at night than it does during the day. Well, there you go. Anyhow, DeForest made the audion tube, which amplified those signals. So we're just doing a quick catch up here. Um, let's see, World War I, as we said, came around. It was really a kind of an amateur enthusiast type of thing at the time, you know, the way that like early computing was like hackers in their garage, like playing with stuff, you know. The legend is Jobs and Steve Wozniak, no, Steve Jobs and I can't remember, is it a Steve Wozniak too, two Steves? You know, creating the first prototype Apple computer in their garage. Well, back in the day, they were doing that with radio. But after World War I, a lot of people learned more about radio, and they were ready to kind of bring it into a business. We talked about the explosion of the radio industry in the 1920s, like 500 more radio stations in five years. So it's just like everyone's getting into the business. And uh, the confusion there over what was radio going to become. At first they thought it's point to point. We'll charge people for sending messages. Uh, but then they realized, no, we can turn this into a, 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 you know, an entertainment medium. And it was, uh, is it on this slide? David Sarnoff with his uh, little essay that he wrote about radio being a music box. Where did that come? There it is, the radio music box memo. So David Sarnoff, who became the president of NBC for decades, one of the most powerful people in broadcasting in, of, of the last century, uh, had that vision in the beginning that, hey, we could use radio to send music and entertainment into people's homes. And that was great, but how the heck would you pay for it? Because you could you know, charge someone to send a message per minute, like an infomercial. But that would interrupt the entertainment. People would not like the medium. So then they realized that you could do what they called chain broadcasting. Remember, which is that connect a, connect a bunch of stations into a network and then broadcast the, um, the, the great content you could create, let's say, in New York or Los Angeles, broadcast it all over the country. You know? So early networks they called chain broadcasting. And that puts together, you know, uh, a, a, a radio industry kind of like what, you know, television was to us, you know, in the 80s and 90s. It was uh, the major mass electronic medium. Everybody bought a radio. Uh, people would sit at home during the Depression. They didn't have money to go out and stuff, but they had a radio so they could get entertainment and information, you know. And uh, the government got into it, started regulating stuff. So, you know, prior to the Radio Act uh, and the FRC, which followed up, it was sort of chaos. You know, anyone could start up a radio station, pick your frequency, start broadcasting, you know, and then somebody else could come and take the same frequency and wipe you out. You know, so there's no way a business could actually work. So it's really chaotic. But the government gets involved creates this federal radio commission and starts licensing stations and then you got some protection. It's like, hey, I'm here in Baltimore. I've got the license for this frequency. Anybody else gets on at my frequency, I can call up and the FCC will stop them. You know, which is very good. That's a big, a big step. Um, now, uh, there's a whole tradition of government not getting involved in people's speech in this country, right? First Amendment. Uh, you know, it's, it's in the Constitution. Uh, the government is not supposed to get in and censor people and stop them from talking about stuff. And the special exception is being made to that here by saying that, yeah, radio is a form of speech. Like, people are sending out messages. Uh, but the government should have some role in, you know, licensing and controlling that form of communication. 
And the way that they explained it to everybody was, you know, the radio waves around us are a public good, just like the land and the water and everything here in America is a public good. We've agreed that we should have a government which, you know, organizes and controls these public assets for the betterment of our people, you know? And so the radio waves are going to fall under that kind of logic, that it's a public good, and so the government is going to organize it and hand it out to people so that they can use it in a responsible way. So that's how they kind of, you know, justified getting in and regulating speech, which is against the First Amendment, but uh, they, um, you know, they said, well, so we, we got to do this for the betterment of the public. So that was it. But you'll see that there's a lot of pushback on that, too, even today now, um, when the government gets in, you know, messes around in regulation, the broadcasters will sue them to say, no, you can't do that. You know, you're going too far, impinging on our speech. We ended up last class with just one example of the incredible programming that came out in the 19, you know, from the late 1920s all the way through to the 50s, basically. A very creative radio industry with, uh, you know, playing the music of all the great singers and stuff, and also drama like War of the Worlds. And, you know, we found, we found also people recognizing all of a sudden, wow, this is really, really influential. This, this can, we talked about people being fall, fooled by the War of the Worlds broadcast, but oh, there's other stuff in politics, you know. Uh, FDR, uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, president during the Great Depression, started broadcasting, uh, him, you know, what he called the fireside chats. He would just, you know, him in a microphone in the White House talking to the people. And that also turned out to be incredibly influential. You know, prior to that, the president would make speeches in front of a thousand people. Oh, we shall not do this or that. Uh, or speak to reporters and they would, you know, be the go-between. So they would write their snarky comments about what he said. Then all of a sudden with radio, it's like this guy is sitting in your living room talking to you one-on-one. -on -one, you know, saying, you know, do not be afraid. The economy is crashing, the banks are defaulting, your life savings are gone, you're, you're, you, know, you're, you're, uh, you lost your job, you're wondering how you're going to live, but we're here for you. We're going to fix this. You know, please, <laughs> stop trying to take all your money out of the banks and rioting when you can't do it. You know, settle down, people. And, and it was very influential. And it became this kind of direct contact between the president and the people, which goes on today. Can you guys think of any forms of direct contact that we're seeing now between the president and the people? Twitter. Twitter. Yes, the president is a great tweeter, right? So that's a new type of thing. And did Obama do any of it before? Oh, he did, he did. I mean, you may not have been as aware of it because Trump's tweets are famous. But Obama would do like YouTube direct talks, you know. And again, he wouldn't have to go through the networks. He wouldn't have to be interviewed by Charlie Rose, who lost his job uh, um, due to sexual harassment. But, you know, he, he, Obama would just be able to go directly to, um, to the people. So uh, presidents have tried to take advantage of this for a long time. But again, it all comes down to the particular qualities of electronic media, which allow that kind of intimacy, or in Trump's case, he totally dominates, you know, the news by saying provocative things at just the right moment on Twitter. And so many people follow him. It's like one person sitting there, you know, has the attention of literally, you know, hundreds of millions of people across the world. So it shows you the power still of this type of thing. I mean, speaking of radio, early in the radio uh, industry, uh, the newspapers, which had you know, been the dominant mass media before, recognized that they were in competition with radio and that radio could really hurt their business. So for a while, uh, the newspapers would not allow radio to use any of the news that they generated. And radio wasn't you know, a big enough business to sort of set up and do radio journalism and stuff. Uh, so for a while, it was, uh, 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 you couldn't really get news on radio. 
But then they, um, they sat down and made a deal at the Biltmore Hotel in New York, which is why they call it the Biltmore Agreement. And uh, they said that, okay, we're going to settle this. Um, the you know, radio can take our news and do news broadcasts, but only after we've sold our newspapers. So radio news was going to be limited to after the evening edition of the newspaper came out. Um, and that pretty much started, opened the door for radio to provide news as well as entertainment uh, to other people. And, uh, you know, radio news developed and became quite, um, I mean, you know, it became a thing of its own. There, Edward R. Murrow is, is mentioned here. He had a couple of shows, first in radio called Hear It Now. Uh, and if you look that up on YouTube, you'll, you'll be able to hear recordings of Murrow basically during the Second World War, he went over to London and he broadcast live from London. So the radio waves would cross the Atlantic. And, uh, and he'd be on live um, and you'd hear the bombs blowing up around him. And you'd hear him like shouting in fear, you know, and describing what he sees. He'd be like on the roof of a hotel in London or something. And just, just describing the Germans, you know, uh, carpet bombing uh, uh, London. And, and again, this, this was viewed as like really influential that, you know, Americans who would, you know, just read about, you know, an attack a couple of days, it's nothing like, you know, hearing somebody in real time experiencing, you know, the same attack. Right? So, so it's credited with, uh, with making war much more present in, in the minds of Americans and maybe, maybe, you know, that led to them feeling they had to get involved, which was not something that was universally agreed on at the time. So that's again how electronic media could be uh, very influential. Uh, so yeah, during wartime, First World War, you know, radio was just getting off the ground, but in the Second World War, there are huge impacts, you know. My kid, my kid uh, collects coins, and so he's got steel coins from the war period where, you know, they, they couldn't get copper. They were using copper for technology, other stuff, so they made the, even the money was changed. But in the, in the, in the newspaper business, uh, they, they ran out of newspaper. They ran out of paper to print on. So the newspapers had trouble, you know, putting out enough uh, newspapers to keep their business going, but at that time, radio, right, you're not actually printing anything. So radio had a really good time uh, because it was, um, uh, you know, all the advertising went over to radio because there, there wasn't enough paper to print newspapers and stuff. Uh, but, you know, also they had to slow down making radios because all of the circuitry and the manufacturing and stuff it was all turned into, like, wartime technology and stuff. So it was... Uh, it was it was a you know a good good period for the radio business. Um, so there are two types of radio. Uh, there's AM and FM. Um, I asked if people listen to AM radio. Does anybody listen to FM radio? <laughs> In your car, you probably listen to FM, right? So FM has better sound quality. Uh, it's it's a less powerful transmitter, uh, but. You know, it has better sound quality. It comes in in stereo. And uh, it, it, weirdly enough, it was created in the 1930s, uh, but it never managed to take over from AM radio, which was the original type of radio, uh, until the 50s and early 60s. And there's a bit of a sad story there, which, um, this is written up in many places, but we could go back to that YouTube doc that we uh, looked at quickly just to, uh, to see um, the early days of radio and to have that technology explained to us. Well, um, FM was a competing system. Here we go. And this guy will tell us more about it. With a microphone and then combine it with uh, the radio waves. In the radio receiver, it all gets separated out again. You can see this very clearly on an oscilloscope. If I turn on this little radio, then I now plug the oscilloscope in to the loudspeaker. It's a bit, a bit large. This is giving a picture of the sound signal, and you can see it roughly matches the sound that's coming out of the loudspeaker. 
Now if I plug it in further back on the circuit, uh, this is the sound signal combined with the radio waves. You can see the peaks still roughly match the sound that it's making and the radio waves are actually going rapidly up and down in the middle. Now if I stretch this out a bit, these are the actual radio waves and you can see what's happening is that the sound is constantly changing their size or their amplitude. And that's why this is called amplitude modulation or AM radio. The man who designed much of the practical circuitry for AM radio was an American called Edwin Howard Armstrong. While in France during World War I, he invented the superhead circuit which has been used ever since. He then sold a patent to RCA back in America. I have an appointment to see Mr. Sarnoff. Oh, Mr. Sarnoff's expecting you, Mr. Armstrong. Thanks. You're welcome. He became a millionaire overnight and fell in love with the chairman's hey, secretary. Uh, how about you come for a spin in my motor? Okay. Hop in there. Oh, it sure is a big one. He bought a huge Hispano Suiza and climbed his tallest aerial to impress her. They were married soon afterwards. Will you marry me? Oh, Howard, my hero. The fundamental principles of radio have remained unchanged. This is the BBC transmitter at Brookmans Park, broadcasting medium wave radio to South East England. Inside, the engineers have restored the BBC's very first transmitter, built by the Marconi Company in about 1920. This end of it actually creates the radio waves and this end of it combines them with the sound signal, the amplitude modulation. It's basically a series of giant tuned circuits with... Uh, jump ahead. The biggest change in broadcast radio since the war has been the introduction of FM. The great advantage is that it's much less susceptible to interference. The spark which drowns out AM radio is hardly audible on FM. Mr. Sasha, why should you use the phrase guerrilla warfare? Because there are... FM stands for frequency modulation. The principle behind it is really quite simple. Instead of the sound altering the amplitude of the radio waves, as in AM, it alters their frequency. FM radio was yet another invention of Howard Armstrong. He started work in the early 30s with a missionary zeal to produce true hi-fi radio. After encouraging tests with RCA, the company suddenly pulled out. Sarnoff! Well, why have you cancelled my project? Ah, get off my back. Hi-fi radio you is nothing. the thing We're into of the TV future. Future. When FM radio was becoming established, Armstrong and RCA started a lengthy battle over the patents. You have stolen my ideas. You did lying. not. Uh, I was the inventor. Oh, certainly not. How, how this had a disastrous that? effect on his health and on his marriage. Oh, I've had such a terrible day. By the way, I'm leaving. This is the last straw. I can't take any more. Uh, Sure. FM has now become firmly established. Yo. Yo, it's true. It's true. You can look it up in the New York Times. The most brilliant inventor in the history of radio who pretty much single-handedly made FM radio work it was Howard Armstrong, and he did commit suicide. And it, it was actually in the early 50s, I think. Um, but uh, yes, he married Sarnoff's uh, secretary, and uh, yeah, Sarnoff and Armstrong were really tight for a long time, but they fell out over FM radio. Armstrong, such a brilliant inventor, um, felt that, yes, of course, you know, we should have the very best FM system, radio system that exists, and that's clearly FM. It had better quality. It didn't, like, crackle when there was a thunderstorm and stuff, a lightning storm. Um, Armstrong, who was a millionaire from those early inventions that he did when he was in, in the war, uh, he, he 
like built these prototype FM stations, like pouring his fortune into that because he figured, yeah, FM will take off and I'll have, you know, two or three of the first stations and I'll make a fortune because when FM takes off, I'll already have all of it built. But Sarnoff, uh, you know, uh, tied him up with legal battles and then uh, uh, um, interfered with the Congress and the FCC regarding the development of FM. And eventually, he even, Sarnoff even convinced uh, the FCC when it finally accepted FM and started licensing it, he made sure that they used different frequencies than Armstrong's transmitters and stations had already started working with. So in other words, he, he, you know, he did everything he could to completely destroy Armstrong. And uh, Armstrong, uh, uh, you know, uh, took it very badly. You can read in the New York Times, you know, he wrote like, you know, lo a long essay about how unfair it was that, you know, the true inventors of technology were never recognized and it's really the business people who get all the credit and stuff. And he killed himself. Yeah, jumped out of his penthouse, uh, New York City penthouse apartment and, and died. Which, you know, even even more ironic, I guess, was he was a guy who would, you know, climb up a uh, 200-foot antenna and stuff just for the thrill of it. You know, so, so uh, a sad story. But so Armstrong was, you know, one of the great inventors really, gave, who did FM. Well, FM was, you know, suppressed due to all of that uh, until the 1950s when um, television had kind of taken over. And uh, a, a lot of people were, you know, that was the dominant medium and a lot of advertising dollars were going there and all of the stars from radio were going over to TV. And so FM, radio had to kind of reinvent itself. And uh, luckily for radio, there was a boom in interest in popular music. And, uh, and so FM, you know, really took off at that point because it had better sound quality. And then very soon they figured out how to make stereo. And so, you know, into the 1960s, FM really became more popular because it had great sound quality. And, uh, you know, that kind of replaced all of the many things that AM radio uh, did. You know, variety shows, detective shows and stuff. All that went to TV. Radio was, could have died, but instead it changed. Um, so catching up to today, what's going on in radio now? Of course, we still have AM and FM. Um, as I can tell from you folks in the class, not a lot of people maybe listen to terrestrial radio, but if you have radio in your car, you know, uh, that's where most people have it now. So uh, radio has focused a lot on the audience that's in the car and sells a lot of their advertising to, you know, companies that want to reach you while you're out on the road, like fast food or, you know, a variety of stuff. And, and radio programming on a lot of radio stations is dedicated to, you know, very short news or traffic and stuff like that. Those are the stations that still really work in terrestrial radio. So by terrestrial radio, we mean AM, FM comes out of an antenna. Um, but we've, got, we've had some other developments in radio. Uh, anybody get satellite radio in their car? Sirius XM? No? Sometimes when you rent a car, it'll come along with it. Or if you buy a new car, it'll come like three months free so you can get to know what the service is like. And then, so it's a subscription service of radio and it's got digital quality. Because, you know, we said this like a couple weeks back, but digital is the thing that changed everything. So now this kind of satellite radio comes to you in a digital stream, which means that it's got perfect reproduction. It's like listening to a CD or to any, you know, streaming audio any other way. Um, they started off as two services, both of them trying to get subscribers, and that didn't work. Uh, there weren't enough people willing to pay money for radio. And so the two companies who are competitors fused into one company. So there is only one, you know, Sirius XM, it's called now, one satellite radio uh, provider. They merged in 2008. You can get it at home, but it's mostly in the car where people subscribe to it. It's got great sound quality. It's got like hundreds of channels. 
uh, which is you know not like regular terrestrial radio. So they program you know very kind of there's there's a 60s channel, a 70s channel, an 80s channel, a 90s channel, an underground channel, a, you know five hip hop channels and so on and so forth. So all kinds of very kind of niche specialized uh, channels. It's it's pretty cool. Um, However, it did not kill over-the-air radio. People still like their free radio. And there's two things about it. Uh, it's a national service, so same programs all over the country, which means that you can drive from coast to coast and you just stick to your one channel and your one service versus if you're taking you know, traditional uh, terrestrial broadcasting, you, you got to find another radio channel to listen to as you drive. But this will this will carry you one channel across the country. But on the other hand, it doesn't have any local flavor to it. It's like you can't hear, you know, a DJ from Oakland when you're driving in this area. You're hearing someone who's just like this person personality, probably from LA or New York. You know? Yeah, or they're getting like personalities from uh, uh, like bigger markets. So. The, the, small, uh, the smaller ones that want more personalized information don't have access to it. That's exactly right, yeah. So one of the ways that uh, old school AM and FM radio is trying to keep relevant is to say, yeah, we, we do have local you know, specificity. We do have DJs from here. And we, you know, we do play music from here. So, so yeah, localism is some, you know, that cuts both ways. Localism is, is something that regular radio is still trying to promote. Um, there's another system, uh, which is digital radio that's actually broadcast at the same time as terrestrial radio over the same frequencies. Uh, so believe it or not, does, it, does anyone have a digital radio receiver? I really doubt it. If you don't listen to regular free radio. Well, uh, like the clear channel stations here in San Francisco, most of the big broadcasters do this now. It's called in-band, on-channel, IBOC digital radio. So that means that uh, you know, if you tune to like uh, 107.1 or 106.1, let's say, you can get the regular FM broadcast. But if you have a digital receiver on that same frequency, it will get the digital broadcast of the same thing. Better quality. And also, you can get sub-channels, so just the way on a television set now, you can get channel 8, sub-channel sub 1, sub-channel 2, sub-channel 3. You can get that on this digital radio, too. Unfortunately, it was slow adoption because it cost the broadcaster a lot to put, that in a, that, to put in a, the digital transmitter part of it. And it didn't bring them really anything else. You know, it was like a small part of their audience would want to listen to it in digital instead of regular broadcast. Uh, and uh, it didn't allow them to sell anything to advertisers so that they could make any more money. It was just like basically their audience stayed the same. Uh, so the only thing that they could do is offer a couple of different sub-channels. So if they were a big, you know, hip hop station, they could also do a Spanish language subchannel, you know, on the same frequency, and you know maybe diversify a bit of what they did. So, IBOC exists, but uh, it, it has not really changed terrestrial radio. Uh, you know, uh, when we look at the business developments, what did change in radio is that in the 1990s, a few companies bought up all of these radio stations, so that you'd have an owner of like. 800 radio stations like iHeartRadio right now is the biggest. Um, so that was a change. But in terms of technology, not a whole lot changed there. But now we get into this. So how many people stream their music through Spotify? We got Spotify users, Apple Music, or no, that's not, that's a, okay, William's nodding, but so it's mostly Spotify. Anyone use Pandora? Sometimes. A couple people, sometimes. What, why, why don't you use it more often, Joe? On Spotify, you get to choose your music. OK. Use, uh, college disc. Versus Pandora, so it'll give you custom stations, but not, yeah. not that you can choose, really. Yeah. Is that your experience, too? Yeah. 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 I prefer just to listen to like random music just to see what's out there. OK. So, and, and how do you do that? Just mainly on Pandora, I'll like, search up like, an artist, like, either Bruno Mars or something. And, like, they'll play like, Bruno Mars songs. 
and, and barriers. Other stuff that's similar. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and do you do that uh, to your phone, like mobile as well? I even do it through my phone. Okay, okay. Hey, folks with Spotify, I mean, do you, do you, is that what you listen to when you're walking to school or stuff like that? I actually just download Spotify. music and put it on iTunes. The app music. So you download it and stuff? Yeah, and I just transfer it to my phone. Interesting. But can I assume most of you have like unlimited data streaming plans? Is that how you do it? No? no I, get, I get taxed. Okay. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> so you got to choose your times or? Yeah, yeah, for yeah. sure. Okay. I mean, I think that's probably the only thing standing between, like, just, you know, nonstop ubiquitous use of streaming services instead of, instead of, uh, uh, you know, terrestrial radio is, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's an industry on its way out. I think the government would like to take back those frequencies and, you know, organize them to give them to like data, data providers and stuff because there's a lot of, of. of of spectrum which is still assigned to FM and AM radio that could be used a lot better by digital technologies and stuff. So, so they would like to take it back. Yeah, do you see that that's being scaled back yeah. in the future? Yeah, I think so. You know, maybe they'll take AM especially, but but yeah, they want to go there for sure. Uh, and and I think uh, IBOC will go and, and yeah, that's going to happen. But uh, who knows exactly when? One thing they, they don't, FCC doesn't like to destroy business. They tend, like, they tend to protect what's there. But, but you know, this is the audience who's moving over, like you guys are moving over. So copyright has been a big deal in this age of streaming and stuff. And so uh, uh, we'll see this in uh, other weeks uh, going forward. But you know another another issue that's arisen for um, streaming streaming radio systems, for instance, uh, stuff and, and podcasting music, things like that, is uh, the complications of uh, of copyright and artists getting paid for what they um, you know rightfully have created. So back in the early days of broadcasting, ASCAP. Um, the American Society of Composers and Performers was created. There's another one called BMI. There's another one now called CSAC. So they collect money from radio stations on behalf of the composers and performers of the music that gets played up there. And it was a pretty easy deal. Like the radio station would just give 5% of their profit to ASCAP or BMI or whatever. And they would track all of the spins, you know, all the music that they played, and, and that's how they would figure out who gets what check from that. But uh, in in the in the current age, you know, it's a, it's more complicated. Um, and to address that, Congress did the Digital Millennium Copyright Act in the 1990s, and that was trying to update copyright to take you know account of the way that digital content really uh, is, you know, all over the place and flows everywhere. Um, and so it has a different set of rights, and it has a different collection agency called Sound Exchange, which collects money for digital performance. So you know now you've got even more players involved in uh, basically negotiating with anybody who distributes this music, like you know whether it's a radio station or an online streaming service or you know a podcast uh, outfit or something. They have to deal with one or more of these entities to pay for that, uh, and uh, uh, there's a there's a feeling that uh, it's been set up to stop small broadcasters from you know for, from you for instance to have a radio station run out of your bedroom. They don't like that, right? So they they make it expensive and difficult to do, uh, so that something like iHeartRadio, which has hundreds of regular radio stations and has sweet inside deals with all the music owners and publishers like Sony, et cetera, uh, it's, it's much more tilted towards them being you know, the leaders of online music provision, uh, even though the technology would allow any of us to sort of set up our own radio station and run it. But they make sure that that doesn't happen. Uh, so, can online radio compete with broadcast? Uh, you know, there are content restrictions in broadcast. You know, you can't say cuss words, for instance. We'll get into that later on. In digital, you can, of course, because it's not regulated the same way. Um, 
but until you know until there's really cheap uh, data plans, basically, um, I think there's still a place for terrestrial radio as we're going forward. And uh, so now, you know, now looking at radio, we could say that, well, radio, it looked bad for radio now, but it looked bad for radio in the 1950s when TV kind of took away their audience. And so radio managed to reinvent itself before. Maybe radio can reinvent itself now. Um, any ideas where radio might still be relevant, like, like terrestrial radio, AM and FM? We did mention one already. Car. In the car, absolutely. Yep. So, in the car, uh, the local aspect, that's another one. So, the argument that, you know, well, we're here in the Bay Area, we've been here a long time, you know, we're out in the community all the time. Uh, Spotify, there's nobody there, right? It's like a digital jukebox. You hear the music you like, but you don't hear personalities. You can never go to an event and run into, you know, a DJ or somebody who has this taste that you really think is cool or whatever. Um, so there's the local aspect. And, and also we're seeing, you know, radio moves more and more to like talk. So comedy, sports, you know, things that work really well with talk. And again, that's kind of coming out of your, um, your locality. Like KNBR, there's a, a DJ there who was a student uh, that I knew at San Francisco State, you know, Ryan Covey. And he's like a sports talk radio guy, you know, and, and known him for years. And, and he has a following and stuff. But, you know, again, that's, that wouldn't happen on a national scale, that, that kind of interview. So, so there are, you know, still this notion we could return to localism. We could have more local radio. And, and uh, that, might, that might be, these, these might be part of the clues as to where radio is going. Believe it or not, your smartphone could be a radio receiver, but it's not. Uh, they disable that function just to make sure that, you know, you're going to get everything through streaming rather than, you know, where, where your data is being monetized versus free radio, right? Um, and yet again, what we just caution is saying, you know, maybe smartphones are not going to destroy uh, uh, radio. Maybe they're going to uh, just supplement it and so on and so forth. Whoa. And finally, I mean, I'm just looking up at here. I'm a volunteer at a station which was a streaming station that's going to become a low power FM station. I think this week or next week it's going to go back on the FM dial. So that's exciting. It's called KXSF 102.1. Uh, and it's going to play like a really wide variety of, uh, of music and stuff. So it should be good. Um, so that's it. Boy, that's the chapter. Let's play a little Kahoot if we can. <laughs> okay. Did everyone kind of log in there? If you can, I'm going to start this. Uh, all right, I'm going to start now. I hope those are have jumped in who are going to jump in. Ten questions to this Kahoot. So if you're just, you know, David Sarnoff's Radio Music Box memo described a way to make money from broadcast radio. Is that true or false? There we go. All right, seven people got it right. That's excellent. So yes. Sarnoff uh, was the uh, radio music box, the visionary who thought, oh yeah, we can send uh, entertainment over the radio. Next question, radio news was controversial. The press radio war happened, settled by the Biltmore Agreement. So remember there was the Biltmore Hotel in New York. Did they sit down there and make a deal? Whoa, even split, 4-3, but it was true. They did sit down. The, Representatives of the newspapers and radio sat down and made an agreement that the radio would wait until the newspapers were published and then they could take the news. So that was the Biltmore Agreement named after them. Who invented FM radio? Was it Heinrich Hertz, Reginald Fessenden, Marconi, or Howard Armstrong? Let me think of jumping out of my penthouse. Yes! I applaud you. Everybody got it right. Edwin Howard Armstrong single-handedly invented FM radio, but stabbed in the back by Sarnoff, lost his wife, and committed suicide. Mm -hmm. Who proved that electromagnetic energy traveled through the air? Mm. Whoa, okay. Well, the right answer was Heinrich Hertz, okay? So those who were fooled by Marconi, remember that Marconi is usually the guy attributed with, you know, the inventor of radio. 
But Hertz didn't think about radio. He proved that electromagnetism exists with that spark gap experiment that we saw reproduced in this video. So it's Hertz, Heinrich Hertz. All right, now what did Lee de Forest invent? He actually invented a bunch of things, but he invented something, a tube that amplified the radio signal. What was the name of that tube? Oh, nobody got it. Oh, that's terrible. Okay, so the Audion tube. So remember audio maybe in there. Audio for, you know, sound or something. It was the Audion tube that DeForest invented. All right, what's the reason that Congress gives itself for being able to regulate broadcasting? Is it because American broadcasting is a commercial enterprise? How do we do? Well, the actual good answer is the airwaves belong to the people. That's it, okay? All right, we'll review this before quiz. Don't worry if you got it wrong. This is just early stuff. There's no grade here. 34, what we were today referred to as a network was called what? What did they call network in the early days? Yes, it's called chain broadcasting, right? Because you had all these stations all over the country and through long distance telephone lines, they would distribute the content that would get played by the network. Chain broadcasting, excellent. How are we doing on time? I think we may have a minute or two left. Prior to the Radio Act of 1927, so remember the Radio Act was the government regulation of the radio business. What was going on? All radio stations broadcast on the same frequency. Stations were encouraged to take turns broadcasting. Legislation was inadequate to regulate commercial radio. All of the above. I don't think I told you enough about this, so we're going to skip this because this would just be too tough. The answer is all of the above. Okay, all radio stations were on the same frequency. The, also, stations said, well, you can go from like 9 until 10, and then these guys could take over from 10 to 11, and from, that was not going to work out, but that's how they had it organized. And finally, you know, the, the Radio Act of 1912 just had been there to, to protect like ship to shore communication. It wasn't able to, you know, uh, establish regulations for a business with a bunch of companies broadcasting. All right. Westinghouse was interesting in broadcasting because it would, hmm, we didn't review this one. So I'm going to skip these last because we're out of time anyway. So let's skip this. Let me just tell you that the correct answer here was that Westinghouse got after the First World War, when they divvied up the, the radio industry, uh, Resti Westinghouse got to sell more radio receivers based on the deal that they made. And then finally, last question, and we're just looking at this as review. Radio stations profited during World War II because advertisers bought radio ads instead of print. And the answer to that would be true. I bet you knew it. Because newspapers ran out of paper to print on. And so radio became, you know, the, the advertising medium during the war years. All right, well, next time, I promise we'll have time to do the full Kahoot uh, next Thursday. So, folks, have a good Labor Day weekend. And don't forget to do your assignment, at least the diary part of it.